just before pastor speaks um, there was this was actually 22 minutes so pastor you'd also have 22 minutes hamza knows what it means when we speak of african town uh, when you get to speak you actually get to speak so sorry i asked the moderator if i can have 30 seconds just to quickly speak to the audience and i'm not going to waste your time but first of all i want to invite and welcome Hamza into South African debate, debate context. And it's something we are very proud of, the Muslims and the Christians in South Africa, is that we have the opportunity to show the rest of the world that this conversation can happen peacefully and fruitfully. And therefore tonight, where we are, I want to call upon every single individual here and say, let's do whatever we do for the sake of peace. There's countries at war tonight because people can't speak. We've got an example, guys. And I'm not just virtue signaling. I'm inviting people to exemplify the peace that we have in this beautiful country. In this beautiful country, we've got a past of pain, but we also have a beautiful past of reconciliation and coming together. And that is something I'm very dearly proud of and something that we will take forward in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll start my 22 minutes, you said. Excellent, thank you. Okay, guys, so uh, thank you so much, Hamza. That was a wonderful presentation. It was something uh, that I actually looked at quite severely, and I thought your first few points were actually quite good, and I thought I'll build on that, and then in my rebuttal, I'll focus on some of the questions uh, that you posited. Let me just start in my presentation and say that Michael C. Rea, Dr. Michael C. Rea mentions that when we speak about divine love specifically, we cannot speak of it as an uh, idealized form of human love because God is obviously greater or beyond that very love that we want to speak of. He's greater than the love that we can conceive in our mind. But when we look at our hearts and when we look at what we mean when we speak about love, we need to understand that we need to give a conceptual understanding of that love that gives us an in, uh, interesting uh, uh, understanding and an interesting perspective on how we define that love. And I thought what I will do is, is I will give you an understanding and a description of what I believe to be an apt description of the love of God. Not merely based on what God does, but who God is. And both of our communities can agree that uh, our gods are love, but there are varieties of love that we need to speak about. We can speak about romantic, erotic, valial, parental, and all these different types of love. But what is important is that when we articulate a maximal divine love, uh, Rhea says the following, we need to uphold two things. Divine love has to include the fact that God desires union with us. We heard from Hamza Said, he mentioned that God granted the revelation, he granted the Quran to communicate with Muslims. Christians believe that we also have a revelation in the Old and New Testament, but pray and ultimately we see also that there's an actual incarnation of the Son of God to express himself. And then Ria speaks of the second conception that is necessary to articulate divine love. And he speaks of God's desire for our good. Now, it's interesting that I think in our presentations, we can affirm a lot of the tenets that are necessarily uh, depicted in these two uh, points that Ria is making. Uh, and let me just say, I did not just lean on Ria, but I also looked at other scholars like uh, Harry Frankfurt, Mark Murphy, um, also... Um, Eleanor Stump uh, and a few others that actually concludes exactly the same point. So from this point we can then mention that any cogent conception of God is the recognition of a deity that expresses an interest in personally engaging with mankind, informing them to his essential nature which could be defined in all possible worlds as benevolent or holy. And I don't mean benevolence and holy in the same way. I mean it in a separate uh, context with, it, with its given meaning. So it is the prophet Jeremiah that very early on speaks to us and tells us that God demands the following. And here's the prophecy. Jeremiah the prophet is speaking and he's telling us this is what God is saying. Let not the one who boasts boast in this that he understands and know me. And let him acknowledge me and honor me as God and recognize with any doubt that I am the Lord who practices loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For these things I take great delight in, says the Lord. 
My aim is therefore to inform by the scriptures of the Christians and also through Christian scholarship is that we can explore some of the key foundational uh, understandings of love and the conception of God. And in my understanding of this love, I'm going to propose three things, three premises, and then a fourth, which will conclude in my final point. First of all, for us to understand what it means when we speak about love, we need to understand what it means when we speak about personal and personhood because God communicated. Secondly, I agree with Hamza that there needs to be an adequate understanding or knowledge. But out of that knowledge, there needs to be a correspondence as to what could be upheld when we speak about who God is. And then lastly, that needs to inform our love. Now, when I speak and when I look at just the understanding of what Christians call to be Christian love, uh, I can say quite clearly that in the last few years, we've seen quite a few scholars speak on the love of Allah. I do not necessarily agree with everything they've written, but there's an attempt made in Christian scholarship to describe what Muslims uh, speak about when they speak about love. And I thought for the sake of the discussion, what I will do is I will speak about the distinctions of what and where that love comes from when we speak about love in a Christian context. So again, I want you to keep these three things in mind, person, personhood, if you want to say that, knowledge, correspondence of the attributes, and then obviously what is love. Theologian Steve Boyer and Christopher Hall mentions that personalness is not a quality that God has, it is who Yahweh is. He is the source and fount and ground of all that we can call personal. It is essential to his nature. When we look at the Christian God and when we look at the Judeo scriptures, we can see quite clearly that we are instructed to look for that personal relationship with God. My question tonight is very simply, do you know God personally? You see, there's a lot of things that God can do in both of our communities that could be deemed personal. We believe that God is personal. We believe God grants revelation. But do we know him personally? Uh, and even though uh, if we are instructed to know him in Scripture, we need to then say that God made it possible for us to adequately know him. But we've got a problem. Because when we look at Surah Ali class, it declares quite succinctly that none is unto or, un, or, or like unto Allah. Uh, Dr. Ronald Nicholson then says emphatically the word shaks or the word person is not applicable to Allah. Allah is nowhere described in any term that implies for Muslims what, is to, what the word should be known when it implies to us when we look at Christians. Muslims for the most part, when they refer to Allah as personal, do not speak of him as a personal uh, a person. Allah is entirely different. And this is the word from Dr. Ryan Nicholson. Uh, so Allah is personal. But in Christianity, we go further and we say, but God is also person. Uh, and Dr. Nichols agree when he says that some elements of likeness without some degree of moral affinity is that which is communicated to the created order in order to make God known. The Jewish scriptures tell us that we are foundationally created in the image and in the likeness of Yahweh. So we can commune with him in love, we can apprehend his perfect will and his holiness. So his transcendence are kept distinct, but his imminence is made known to us personally. Secondly, when we speak about knowledge, Arthur Triton mentions that God is a nature which only he knows. Both of our communities can agree that when we look at our understanding of God, God is infinite. And it would take an infinite mind to know him. And I don't know about you, but there's no other mind in this world which can infinitely know God. We can only know what God has revealed about himself. What can be known about God? You see, the priority for the Christian, though, is to press on and to tell that we pursue what is revealed about God himself. Uh, a favorite scripture that my Muslim friends love to mention is the Apostle John's scripture in John 17 verse 3, where Jesus speaks and he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. Now, before we get to the divinity of Christ, the priority is to know God personally and intimately. 
Jesus also makes it clear in Matthew's gospel that no one can know or come to the Father but through him. And no one can know and come to the Son but through the right of the Father. The Apostle Paul then confirms quite succinctly, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For the Christian, there is no knowledge of Yahweh where there is no true and full revelation of Jesus Christ. Christianity hinges on the proximity of intimacy with Jesus Christ. Theologian Gerald Bray says to be Christian is to believe that it's possible to know Yahweh intimately and more than that, it's to believe that Yahweh has made it possible for us to know him by revealing himself to us. This is what it means to know God. So, uh, Professor Keith Ward, which is a dear friend, says that when we reflect therefore upon the Christian God, we believe that there's a conscious relationship of love which we can pursue with God because God is a conscious mind. Dr. Ward's statement would affirm uh, that we can deduce that Allah is ultimately compatible with what can be known about Yahweh's inner life. And in Christianity, there is that balance between what can be known and sometimes what we cannot know. But the point is that we can definitely know God intimately. Now you need to ask yourself the question, what about in Islam? Uh, Fadlo Shihadi, a contemporary scholar of Al-Ghazali, after analyzing Al-Ghazali's arguments about the transcendence of Allah, affirms that Allah is utterly unknowable. For according to Ghazali, things are known by their likeness, and what is utterly unlike what is known to man cannot be known. Allah would have to be unknowable and completely unknowable, not only the man, to the man in the street, but also to the prophets and the mystics as well. This is a conclusion that Ghazali states very explicitly. Islamic scholar is, uh, Al Faruqi, uh, in actual fact, says the same. He says, He, Allah, does not reveal himself to anyone in any way. Allah reveals only his will. And Christians talk about the revelation of Yahweh himself, by Yahweh and of Yahweh. But that is the greatest difference between Christianity and Islam. Can we therefore know and honestly say that we know the love of Allah if it is a mere expression of his will? If it is merely something that he adds to him to make himself known and not something that we can delegatively say he is intrinsically? That is a question that my friend should ask this evening. Can we therefore know that the attributes of Allah or Yahweh is true or even reflective of God when we look at these attributes that are revealed and specifically love? Can we know that God is loving and I mean God in a general sense? Well, John Frame, Dr. John Frame makes the following important note and he writes the following. He says, Yahweh's names reveals his attributes. It tells us what he is at the heart of his being. It tells us what and who he really is. Majid Fakri, a Muslim philosopher, writes about the tension between very prominent Islamic groups very early on in the Muslim dispensation. And he speaks about this fight between the Mutazalites and the Ashari. And he says, Al-Ashari held that the essential attributes of Allah, such as knowledge, power, and life, according to him, subsists in Allah's essence, or it is that, and it's eternal, but cannot be said to be identical with his essence, or distinct from it, since the mode of predicating them from Allah is unknown. So Judin Ali, the uh, author of the renowned book Amali, a Muslim scholar, says the attributes of Allah are not Allah himself. But neither are they distinct nor independent from his being. What are his attributes as manifestations of his being? And works are eternal, kadim, and impersonal. You see, the Christian claim is that Yahweh is revealed personally in Jesus Christ. And there's something descriptive in this man that gives us a glimpse of the heart of God. The author of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 mentions that Jesus is the radiance of Yahweh's glory. And in the Greek it says he's the character des hypostasios. He's the exact representation of God's being. That's why when Philip asks 
Lord, show us the Father. Jesus speaks to him and says to him, I've been with you so long, Philip. And this is John 49. Yet you've, not, you've asked to see the Father. You can see quite clearly that there's this explicit understanding of the revelation of the knowledge and correspondence of these attributes which we speak about tonight. The distinction between the revelation of God in the Quran and in the Bible is that Yahweh is intimately known through the agency of Jesus Christ. Allah of the Quran can attribute himself some attributes, but these attributes do not reveal his essential nature because he's above them. The biblical God Yahweh is revealed in his, in his very nature. And Christian theology dares to ascribe to Yahweh the revealed attributes, saying it is descriptive of his essential being. And the essential characteristic of Yahweh revealed in the Bible is one of love. And my friend mentioned John 3, 16. But 1 John 4, 7 and, uh, to 9 and verse 16 also tells us that God is love. You see, Karen Armstrong says, when she writes on uh, this uh, incredible uh, disparity, she says, the divine attributes of knowledge, power, life, and so on, uh, were real. They had belonged to Allah from all eternity, but they were distinct from Allah's essence because Allah was essentially one. What we say then is that the attributes of Allah does not reflect in any way the bare essence of Allah. That's why Dr. Syed Muhammad Reza Jazi cautions Muslims in his excellent book, The Most Beautiful Names of Allah and the Quran, that they should study the names and the attributes to strengthen their relationship with Allah, but they should stay away from describing his essence. Duncan B. MacDonald therefore says that speaking of Allah's qualities, Ibn Hazm cautions to Umar to say simply that the names and the attributes like Al-Rahmahin, uh, uh, one of Allah's names, apply to him by himself and that they, these qualities, have no right to take them in these qualities as descriptive of a quality that he possessed in his nature. So there's important implications of this. How can you speak of maximal love if that which is evident within Allah cannot even be known or described? You see, the Christian conception of God's ultimate love stems from the actuality that the greatest love is directed from God who loves us from himself. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says that God loves us before we loved him. He first loved us. Dr. John Wesling uses, uses the term then supreme love, uh, and he notes quite clearly that uh, when the supreme love is expressed, it's a supreme love for a person that desires the highest good and all that is morally permissible and metaphysically possible to fulfill in his desire. And unlike in Islam we heard, in the Bible there's also various ways of speaking of God's love. We can speak of a peculiar love of the father and son, and the son to the father, God's providential love over all he's made, God's providential salvific love towards the broken world, God's particular and effective selecting love for all his purposes, and God's provisional love towards sinners. Let me say that in my study so far, some of these instances are evident in the Islamic conception, but they're not all there to the degree that we find it in Christianity. So the proposition God is love expresses itself in the truth and is above all in the essence of God, according to Thomas Talbot. John Zizelus writes, love is not an emanation or property or substance of Yahweh, but it's constitutive of his substance. It is what he is, and it's what he is made of. This is very important for our understanding when we look at the love of God. We can see quite clearly that there is not this constitutive right in the life and in the reality of Allah. That's why Professor D.B. MacDonald notes, therefore, that Allah could suffer no change, could experience no emotion, sorrow, pity, love, and desire could have no part in him. When he acts, it's not because uh, of any action uh, or relation or motive and purpose within him, it's simply by his arbitrary will. So there seems to be quite a void of love when we avail ourselves in the plain reading of the text, and especially Islamic philosophy and theology. Dr. Nicholson then reminds us, and he says, Allah may be called most merciful or love, but it does not mean that he has the quality, essentially, of mercy and love corresponding to anything in man. If he could be so, and in describing that, 
in similar terms of man, the Muslim conception think that he too would be a created being. That's why Robert Riley says, loving is a particular problematic attribute for Allah to possess because it places him in relation to a contingent being. And how can a totally transcendent being of love, a love, a, creat a creature infinitely below, below him? How can that God desire? And then Professor Gordon MacDonald finds that that is exactly what al Ghazali said. He said there must be a lover in the sense of incompleteness and a recognition that the lover is in need of something completely in a realization of the self. For Allah, that is impossible. In other words, Allah cannot love himself or let him go himself in that way. So, where does it leave us? It leaves us with an inept understanding of the love of God. Again, the German Muslim, uh, German Muslim Murat Hoffman then concludes, and he says the following, this is a Muslim speaking. In the Quran, we are told that Allah is self-sufficient. The fundamental self-description uh, definitely excludes that Allah is in love with his creation. Therefore, it is safer, more accurate not to speak of love when addressing Allah's clemency, compassion, benevolence, goodness, and mercy. Robert Riley says brilliantly, Despite the many citations in the Quran about Allah's benevolence for his obedient servants, this must be understood as God's predilection. It's an expression of his will. He may favor man when he obeys him, but he does not love him. The Christian idea of agape and overflowing unconditional divine love for man is completely foreign to al Ghazali's version of Islam. And then he adds a little addendum, and I want to leave this but not so for Sufism. And that is a very different discussion tonight. So what am I saying? Well, the logical flow of my talk tonight says the following. It says that God exists necessarily, but he exists as personally. That personally is a personal being that necessitates communication and personhood. Communicating personally involves, therefore, an imparting of knowledge to the created order, and for this knowledge to be meaningful, it must correspond to God's true essence. If God is maximally loving, his essence must be love, not just his actions. And according to the Judeo-Christian scriptures, Yahweh uniquely fulfills these criteria. Yahweh is essentially love and essentially loving so ask yourself tonight what can be said when we look specifically at the understanding of god's being what can be described and what can be ascribed to what it means when we speak about the personhood of god can i relate to this god as person or can i just relate to him through his arbitrary will what can be known what can be communicated through this god We've seen Ismail Faruqi uh, and other scholars say, not much. And does Allah correspond to that very revelation of that attribute which is revealed, which is love? And I leave you with that. Thank you.